are. Gentlemen on the jury, not guilty. If you're sitting there confused about this case, you're not alone and you're not wrong to be confused. There are so many things wrong with this presentation that we're going to have to take a long time and go through it part by part. I'm going to have to give you guys a lot of information, so I want to dissect this case very carefully and you want to look at it from the angle that matters and then come back. First off, mistakes. Mistakes are material or they are immaterial. My colleague, despite her diligence and very thoroughness, has actually made a mistake in the indictment. She's actually got Mr. McDonald's birthday wrong, not by 10 years. Now, is it a mistake? Yeah, it's a mistake. Is it a material mistake? Well, I don't think she really meant anything by it, but when you go back there, you'll see that his birthday is wrong. So those are mistakes. Specifically, when you get back there, I think it's count three, but you'll see his birthday is wrong. It's off by 10 years. So that's a mistake. And the question is, is that a material mistake? And if it's a material mistake, was something meant by it? So let's go through and let's talk about this case, because this case, candidly, is probably one of the most disturbing and fundamentally important cases that has been presented in a long time here. Because this is a case attacking a man who decided he wished to participate in the political process. Detective Stanton. Detection arguing facts not in evidence. Actually, it's Detective Stanton. Yeah, actually said that. Approach. your appearances for the record. The court has a few comments before we begin. On the record in the matter, case D-505. You guys either agree or I order. You're going to convince me to hold your client in contempt. Raise your right hands, face the court clerk to be sworn.
Any statement that you make is under penalty of perjury. deconstruct 
this nonsensical argument that the state has presented. Where is Miss Hunterton's affidavit? I think it was six. Council, do you remember? Um, I think it was. I think it was nine. Nine. It was not. Seven. Seven. Eight. Eight. Okay, we'll split the difference. <laughs> Material versus non material mistakes. My colleagues got Mr. McDonald's birthday wrong. No big deal. It's not a material mistake. I don't think anybody in their right mind would think so. All right, maybe it was underage drinking case, that might be a material mistake there. But in this case, it's not a mistake. So, Mr. McDonald, in context, is litigating a case. He's got no lawyer. God bless the soul. The lawyer killed himself. He's got no money. So Mr. McDonald has to do this case by himself. Now, imagine getting handed a stack of rules, some paperwork, and everything that's near and dear to you is on the line, and you have to do the paperwork right. And you go to the clerk's office, and they say, nope, can't help you. There's a self-help center. That's it. And these are the people who want to convict that man of a crime. So let's look at this. He has a hearing coming up. He has to go see a therapist. Okay. Ms. Hunterton goes and says, he's been coming to see me. I wrote a brief letter. He'd see me for individual therapy to address his related divorce, his well-being, and develop his insight related to separation from his wife. Given Mr. McDonald, I asked him to write a letter saying that I would not pose any danger to children. I would be willing to do that and have given the opportunity. Now, you heard her. She said he asked for the letter. He came and saw me. I agreed to do it. That was a testimony. I agreed to do it. But I got busy, and it was the end of the day, and we didn't get around to it. It's a court hearing. He's got to have his letter. So he adds the letter in the sentence in for himself. Was that material? No, it's true. She adopts it. There it is. There's her adoption of the letter. She testified under oath now twice. That, yeah, no, I don't think he was a threat to the kids. So how can you have a forgery when you're telling the court something that is true? Remember, he doesn't do this every day. He's down there trying to get his, some access to his children back. So there's no material fraud. There's no element of intent to defraud. If she said no, and he writes yes, the material coin flips the other way. That's clearly a material mistake. This isn't a material mistake. He puts letter in. Then the state wants you to charge him for a felony count every single time he puts the same document on file. No. No. Absolutely not. It doesn't make any sense. Now, then we come to the other key issues here. Perjury. We've got to come back to the concept that my client or my colleague kind of hopped over and she doesn't want you to think about materially. You see Mr. McDonald standing up there and you're raising his right hand, swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth. Was his financial affidavit even material to that hearing? Where was the people that were at that hearing? Where was that lawyer? You saw the lawyer, I don't even know his name, he's busting Mr. McDonald's chops pretty hard. How come he's not up here talking about the hearing? He didn't come in here, and there's been not a scintilla of evidence, not a scintilla of evidence that anything in this affidavit was material to the issue at hand. And since we're all, we've got scientific and technical people, let's go through and let's listen to what we don't have, or let's hear what we don't hear. And I just said that intentionally, make it your attention. Where is the person on the witness stand saying, McDonald's a deadbeat and not paying for his kids? Nobody. Why do we think his financial affidavit is material in this particular area? No one says he's behind. No one says he's not paying. 
Nobody. It's not here. It's not in the case. Where's the judge? Where's the judge who said, yeah, we had this hearing, the whole issue was this, and he didn't do it. She's not here either. Why? Because there is no material issue at hand. He is out of favor with the powers that be. And they've combed through his material stuff and trying to find any big human mistake in this paperwork. And therefore, the punishment. This is very different than criminal law that you and I have been taught to do. It. Go out and find the bad guys. That's not this case. This case is, let's find someone who's pissed us off and let's see what kind of crap all of charges we can hang on. Because that is what is in fact happening here. There's nothing in here that's going to make you proud of your legal system. There's nothing here that's going to make you proud of your government. Mr. Willard got out of the witness stand. He's in charge of Nevada court watchers. His fiance posted this website, her employee posted that on this website. And they don't want you to know that. They didn't tell you that. That came out on cross-examination, and only reluctantly. And a 40-year lawyer, who certainly knows how to parse words, did you see his weaselly demeanor on the stand? Um, um, let me think about it. He's not an honest broker. This is a hit job, through and through. Then we talked about the remedies. What kind of remedies does a district court judge have to discipline litigants in, in front of them? All sorts of remedies. We spent two sessions. I came back and asked them second time what the remedies are. And then I asked them, I said, right here, holding the other way, and I say, Mr. Willett, in your 40 years of experience, can you remember another case where the police independently came down to family court and start crawling through somebody's divorce proceedings? Well, there was a case where they kidnapped the kids. Yeah, they kidnapped the kids and took them overseas. Okay, kidnapping? Yeah, that's a criminal charge. I think we can all agree on that one. Does he really? Is that what the state wants? Kidnapping? There's no crime here, folks. Mr. McDonald, if he's committed any crimes, he's committed one crime. That's pissing off people. He criticized the judge. Where's the judge here? He criticized the legal system. Who's here saying that there's any problems? Where's the materiality in these hearings? It's not here. And then finally, this burglary charge. This is troubling as well. Burglary is the entry with intent to commit a crime. How do we know? How do we know? There are people who mean well, there are bright people who mean well, but don't know how to do paperwork, or don't know what's exactly looking for. Every line of work has its favorite, or has its style and its paperwork, order forms for materials, for restaurant supplies. You gotta get things right, you gotta learn your job. But every one of our jobs has its different things. They're called trade practices. Things that are done this way. Mr. McDonald appears being held accountable for not knowing lawyers' trade practices. And here's the other practical problem, and my colleague seems to want you not pay attention to this. This proceeding's been going on for five years. This is five years of who shot Johnny. Oh, well, the people go back and forth with each other. You heard the lady. She spoke highly of Mr. McDonald. Great, good IT tech. I liked him, saw him every day. We were paying him. What day did he start? October 17th. What day was his affidavit from, at least the first one? September, when he was unemployed. Now, I asked, I asked the detective, and I apologize, it was a little out of hand. I asked the detective, you've been through a divorce, yeah? Do you know how often you have to update your forms? No, I've just got through with a divorce. I don't know how often I'm supposed to update my forms, to tell you the truth. All right, I don't know. And I just did it, and I'm a lawyer. He just did it. He's a cop. He doesn't know. So how is Mr. McDonald supposed to know? Now, is that really a crime? Is that really what you want your government to throw people into trouble for? You, not the judge, not I, not my colleagues here, are in fact the final arbiters of the facts of this case. And 
And in this case, there are huge missing gaps. There's materiality. There's no intent to defraud. There are no fraudulent statements. And there's no eyewitnesses. There is no way to prove that what his intent was. And there is no way to determine what was material in that hearing. She has stood up and just wants you to assume and assume and presume. It's a very important case, a very confusing case. And if you're confused, you're right to be. The state has not done a good job presenting this case. And despite her outstanding organizational skills, she can't organize stuff that doesn't exist. Where is the one eyewitness anywhere in this case? Where was the lawyer who cross-examined him? Where was the judge who presided? How about the court clerk who was there? Where was the person that said, yeah, actually, this was a document I saw him sign? None of that's there. Very important case, folks. Very tedious. I sincerely appreciate your time and effort for jury service. When you get back there, I think it's this time, it's 29, is our current, is the common sense instruction. The reason we, as our society, not me, but we as our society have chosen to install juries is because together, each of you have 20, sometimes 30, 40 years living on this planet. You know how the world really works. And the 20, the 12 of you together bring 240, 260, maybe 300, 400 years of life experience. All the walks of life, engineering, communication, security, medicine, we have all sorts of interesting life experiences together. And together you will have more wisdom than collectively than any one individual does. But when you go back there and use your common sense, you should be troubled by this case. You should be deeply troubled by this case. And you should be deeply troubled by what you have not heard. You have not heard any direct evidence. You've not heard any issues of materiality. And we all know, and we all know in the real world, no matter how hard you try, when we all have to get stuff done on deadlines, people make mistakes. And even if someone who's diligent, and I'm sincerely in my compliment, someone who's diligent as my colleague is, she's made a material mistake in this indictment. Now mistakes get made. The question for you to discern is whether these fiddling mistakes are in fact material to the charge. And that's where the heart of this case lies. Where are these material, these material mistakes? And do we really want to put a guy who's representing himself in a conviction, or give him a conviction, in family court? After he paid for a lawyer and the guy killed himself. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth takes a few words, and I'll sit down. This is a not guilty case across the board. I'm going to sit here and go through this with you and very briefly explain this to you. All right, burglary. Burglary under Nevada law is very simple. It's a chop shop. Entry with intent. Guilty of burglary. Now, my colleague has elicited and has advanced three theories. On this one, I guess, was presumably the fourth day of March of 18. Not guilty. What was in his mind when he went there? Well, you heard that he comes down there on the courthouse as a court watcher. That's a court watcher. We don't even know why he was in the court that particular day. What was in his head when he filed it? Was he scheming, you know, I'm going to go in there and file this false document? Or is he like, hey, I've got to go to court. I'm going to sit and watch somebody else. There's no evidence here. You cannot convict Mr. McDonald of burglary beyond reasonable doubt. Forgery. Not guilty. Once again, the letter is submitted. True. Mr. McDonald changed it. True. He confessed to the change. It showed the detective he changed it. The question is, was it from yes to no? Was it material? No. He asked the therapist, will you write this? Yeah, I will. Do you agree with it? Yes, I will. Can you do it? Yeah, come back next week. Well, my hearing's next week. So he changes it. Is that a material change? No. He said exactly in that letter exactly what she intended to say. So that is not guilty. Filing false instrument or record. Okay. What's false? That he wasn't working? That he was? Once again, what is the false in here? 
He had a job for a while, and then he didn't have a job. Should he have updated the records? Did he not update the records? Were the records carried over from a hearing when he didn't have a job until he now has a job? We don't know any of this. The judge isn't here. No one from the courtroom ever showed up in this case. Nobody asked any of the material facts here. So the answer is not guilty. Burglary. Here we are again. Pictures of him standing in the courthouse. Oh, no, he's in the courthouse. So, what was in his head? Now, burglary usually means if you run into a building with a gun, okay, we know that you went in there to commit a crime. That's the burglary. Or if you went in there with burglary tools in your hand, you kick the door in. That's an intention to go in and commit a crime inside. All we have here is a picture of a man in a courthouse. That's not guilty of burglary. Forgery. Once again, not guilty. Same document, yet again, run up, and it gets put back in the pleadings, and it's not guilty. It's not forgery. There's no material effort in it. Perjury. Not guilty. Perjury has to be a material misrepresentation of fact. My client and my colleague here hasn't committed perjury by putting a wrong birthday on the, on the instrument. That's not a material misrepresentation. It's a subsidiary issue. Perjury is on substance. I solemnly swear the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I was never in judge, uh, the judge's courtroom today. I did not sit in Department 28 all day. Now I'm committing perjury. Why? That's, that's a material fact. I was here all day. Everyone knows I was here. Material facts are required for perjury. Once again, what was, the set, what was the purpose of the hearing? What was the purpose of these documents? If the judge says, I want to find out about your work schedule, and he turns in the paperwork for a couple months ago from when he wasn't working, is that really a material fact? We don't know, because it wasn't in the evidence. So the fact of the matter is, that's got to be a not guilty. False document or record, not guilty. Perjury, not guilty. Burglary, once again, I'm in the courthouse, okay, not guilty. Forgery, not guilty. False, not guilty. Read the statute. The false official statement or final false document has to be material intent to defraud. And I've got my notes here. Why? We have 11 charges and no evidence. Why do we have a case started by a detective and not a judge? Why do we have a case that's supposedly taken an off an anonymous website, but actually wasn't off an anonymous website? It was actually Mr. Willis' girlfriend's employee. Why do we have these things? This isn't a criminal case, folks. This is political retribution. This is in pure motives and a case that should be a complete across-the-board finding of not guilty on every single charge. This is very important. Please take your time and go through this with care and deliberation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Council and Mr. McDonald, for giving me a moment to review some documents. Thank you, Mr. McDonald, for giving me a moment to review some documents. Come on up back to the witness stand. I'm going to ask you to put your phone away. Council, continue. recently as per my evidence and I would like to disclose my address. Okay. 
But you're, you're not currently living at 5812 Harmony Avenue? Correct. Okay. That's the address you have listed on your most recent financial disclosure, correct? Uh, I used to sometimes use it as a mailing address. And whose, whose address is that? Stepdad. Are you uh, currently working? Um, I do odd jobs currently. What, uh, what type of odd jobs do you do? Depends. Some, some computer stuff, some real estate stuff. Cleaning up things like... And how much do you get paid for those odd jobs? I try to make it... I do as much as I can to make like $800 to pay my bills. So at least $800 a month. And, and you, you realize that you've listed on your financial disclosure that you, you make $0, correct? I believe that's true. Have you ever talked to your financial disclosures that you filed? Um, I don't think I do. I think it's in the exhibit list. Um, it might be over there. I'm also a student right now and doing my best to, to get work as I tried to get rehired at my old job and was unable to. You are paying for school? Um, I'm going to for financial aid and scholarships. You're submitting paperwork for that or you already have that? I submitted for financial aid, yes. You're not currently receiving it? Um, I got approved. I didn't get approved for last semester, but I should be getting approved for this coming upcoming semester. So you're, you went to school last semester? Yeah. How did you pay for school last semester? Um, through, finan it is through financial aid, I think I still owe them some money on that, so we're, we're still waiting on, on the funds for that. When did you, when did you start uh, in your attending school at UNLV, is that correct? Yeah. When did you start attending school there? Uh, it's the winter semester of 2017. Wouldn't that, isn't that semester still going? No, it's spring semester. And on your financial disclosure, despite listing that you make zero dollars, you claim eight hundred dollars in business expenses, correct? Yeah, I filled it out in a perfect way. Eight hundred is around what I'm uh, currently going for each month. I'm doing my best to earn. Okay, because you also, so you have on your business expenses, you have a car and truck being used for business that you spend $100 a month on? That's a gas charge, I think, if I recall. For insurance, $100? For mortgage or rent, $550? Yeah. Are you renting out a, an office ace? Um, it's zoned commercial and real and uh, residential. So you're living there? And utilities of fifty dollars, correct? That's part of the five Is there an argument to be had? Of the so you have So you, you list here that you're out Average gross income from self-employment or business is eight hundred dollars. Correct. Yes. And then seven hundred fifty dollars in business expenses. Okay. And then you also filled out the personal expense schedule, and you list you have a total monthly expenses of one thousand fifty dollars. Yeah, so I also have a rental contract where I can um, have reduced rent for doing different jobs around the limits of my friend's house. So. Okay, so is that a business address or is that a, a lease? So you're paying five, $550 for rent on a business and $500 for no, rent on an apartment? It's, it's a commercial and residential place. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a big place that I have. I also have beds for my kids. I have everything in place for them as well. Okay, but if you're, as you say here, if you're making zero dollars a month, I didn't state that. But... Okay. I'm gonna have you. Uh, you don't have a. You don't have a copy of your financial disclosure. I'll have you. Uh, 
quick and then I'll answer some questions. girlfriend from high school that's still upset about what happened 20 years ago. 
What does it matter, ladies and gentlemen? What's the relevance of where the allegation came from? What's important is that the detective, doing his job, became aware of an allegation. He investigated, corroborated, he substantiated, and now the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that those allegations were true, and that the defendant, in fact, did what was alleged, regardless of who made that allegation. I can understand the defendant being upset that somebody snitched on him, that's understandable. But why does it matter where it came from? It doesn't. Lest we be confused. In regards to the allegation, first of the residency violation, and then of the forgery, I want to correct a little bit of the timeline. Because there were some questions from the defense about, why didn't you just drop it after you found out he actually lived where he said he did? And the, and the, the detective, you'll recall, tried to correct that. He said, well, by the time I found out that that wasn't a violation, I had already also found out that there was an allegation of forgery, and I was investigating that. So yes, he dropped the residency violation investigation when he found out. But as detectives do, as their job entails, he continued to investigate other things. I mentioned just a moment ago that language is important. Language matters, certainly in trials, and as we've become well aware, uh, certainly in court documents. But specifically, I want to mention a, a couple of these things. Uh, like I said, a, a, an anonymous tip versus a, a public posting. One sounds sexier, right? And it, and, it, and it kind of makes us think more. Another them, one that came up today was court watchers and Marshall Willock. Multiple times, the defense asked him about being an administrator. In fact, just now in his closing, he said, He's in charge of court watchers. You recall, Marshall Willett tried to correct him multiple times and said, no, 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 I have no ownership. No, I'm not in charge of, I'm not an administrator. I contribute sometimes by posting and answering questions as I do on many other sites. He does it, he said, as a public service to people that are asking questions about cases that they have, specifically in family law. The importance of language. Another one, and I apologize we had to sit through that again, you'll have that back in the deliberation room, you can watch all the videos. But the defense counsel said that the, the attorney there for the ex-wife went to town on the defendant. And another time uh, during, during question he said he badgering. Actually watching it over again, I think he was quite polite. Certainly didn't require to apologize later. He's not a danger to his children. Versus, well, I believe him seeing his children would be positive under regulated and recommended guidelines. You see the difference in that language? In regards to that, you heard defense uh, just say, after admitting that his client, the defendant, added the language, he said, this is a quote, he added exactly what she intended to say. That's what defense counsel just say, said. He added exactly what she intended to say. Do you remember Ms. Hunterton on the stand when defense counsel asked her multiple times, well, isn't this substantively true? Substantively versus exactly? And even when he asked, substantively, isn't this what you think? Do you recall her hesitating? And eventually she would say, well, no, I would have written a very lengthy paragraph about what that meant and what it entailed and what would be required. Language matters, ladies and gentlemen. There was a lot just, just spoken about in regards to, well, he didn't know. He didn't have an attorney. Actually, the evidence has showed that he had multiple attorneys. Evidence also showed that 60 to 70 percent of family court litigants don't have an attorney. It's quite regular. What he did know is he apparently knew that he had to file an exhibit list, which is actually a new revision and a new requirement per the expert that testified. He knew that he had to include a financial disclosure form within those. He was very litigious. 
He's not a halfwit, ladies and gentlemen. He's a professional IT salaried employee. Instruction 28 talks about <coughs> ignorance of the law not being an excuse. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Everyone is conclusively presumed to know the law, and one accused of a crime is precluded from using it as a defense. Is ignorance of the law. There's also testimony from, the, from Marshall Willock about the fact that there's a self-help desk. Uh, he actually, like I said earlier, answers questions for free as a public service on multiple websites. As an IT guru, you think you'd know how to use Google and um, research the laws, find out if what he's doing is not right. And yet, despite all of that, according to law, ignorance that what you're doing is illegal is not a defense. It's not an excuse. Defense counsel also pointed out the next instruction, which is the common sense instruction that you can use your common sense as, as smart individuals, although you're sitting in that box, doesn't mean you can't think outside of it. You can think about what a reasonable person would do. You can reasonably infer things based upon the evidence that you've heard, that you'll see, that you have seen, that you can take back there with you and look over again. There was also a lot of questions from the defense about how unique this case is, and he just leaned on that a, a lot. This is a conspiracy, and you know that because this is a very unusual case. The hundreds of thousands of documents posted every year, how many from family court end up here? Let me remind you that there, there are many different crimes. There's, there's murder and there's perjury, right? You could argue one is more serious than the other, but they're both crimes. You have the law that backs up the fact that perjury and forgery and burglary, those are crimes in Nevada. You could argue they're not as serious as murder. I might agree with you. But that's not why we're here. We're here because he committed perjury and forgery and burglary and filing a false document. In fact, the, the defense asked the detective, you'll recall, after establishing he wasn't a family court expert, after finding out that these things had be done, been done, he asked. Did you ask anyone if this was a big deal? Well, the detective laughed a little bit and said, no. And we established that no, he's not an attorney, but he certainly knows that forgery and perjury and burglary and doing the things that the defendant did is a crime. And so as a detective, he investigated that and submitted it. A crime is a crime. And interestingly enough, and he, and he just talked about it again, he, the d defense counsel asked Marshall Willett, in all of your 40 years and thousands and thousands of cases, have you ever seen anything like this? And Mr. Willett said, yeah, I, I've seen it a couple times. But yes, something from family court ends up here. And uh, confident in, in that he knew the answer, he said, well, give us the facts of some of those. And you'll recall that Marshall Willock actually recited the, the name and specific facts of a case. And as you just heard, yes, it involved eventually charges of kidnapping of a father who had lost custody and took his children without permission. But then when asked specifically how that case started, you'll recall, Mr. Willock said, well, it started with a divorce case. And that the father, the defendant, lied about where he lived. That's how it started. Literally almost exactly how this case has started. So yes, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that we end up here in criminal court for criminal allegations and the defendant committing actual criminal offenses. I understand that, and it's been said a lot as well, that family court cases have high emotions. There's a lot of writing. There's a lot of, 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 of bad blood and people yelling there's been a lot said that he wanted to see his kids. And that's evident from some of the posts, the, the, the litigation that went on. You can read the titles and what he was trying to accomplish. 
What I will point out is the bottom here of that same 29 says a verdict may never be influenced by sympathy. Never be influenced by sympathy. Not that you shouldn't. You cannot be influenced by sympathy. The fact that he may have wanted to see his kids, that doesn't mean he could do criminal things in order to see them. That still constitutes a crime, even if his intentions are to see his kids. You cannot be influenced by sympathy, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, that's one of the major reasons you were chosen as jurors. You recall you were asked many, many questions. And among those was that you are willing to follow the law as it's presented to you and as the judge has given it to you, even if you don't agree with it. This, and you'll each have a copy of it, this is your rule book. These are the laws. And if you find that the defendant broke these, regardless of his intentions, to see his kid maybe, that means he's guilty of what he's charged with. Defense brought up that you didn't hear from Judge Marquis. What exactly would you have asked Judge Marquis that we could actually get into? What could she have added to the case that we didn't get into? Same as for the wife's attorney, but we didn't hear from him. What would he have told you that would prove further that you can't see in the video, that he gets sworn in and lies. We have paperwork. What, what would that attorney have added to the case? There's also something said that, that surprised me. <laughs> that the fact that there's 11 felony accounts here proves the weakness of the case. If, if reason follows then, if someone murders five people, there should only be one count of murder? Or if someone does a string of robberies, robs a convenience store and then a 7-Eleven and then a, a Kmart, should we only charge one armed robbery or one robbery? No, each action is a separate offense. And as my co-counsel showed you in her, in her presentation, she went through the elements, the dates. These happen on different dates. It, they actually happen in different buildings. That's why the indictment is specific about where it occurred and the date it occurred. The fact that there's 11 counts doesn't say it's a weak case. It says that it happened over a span of time and with much intent. It was also then asked, or brought up by defense, that the financial disclosure form was not material, specifically to this March 16th hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll have the motions that were filed in preparation for that, including the exhibit, the exhibit list, including financial disclosure form, the letter. It was for a motion to regain custody of his kids. How is his financial status and how much he makes not material to the fact that he wants to regain custody? You heard the family expert, the family law expert, talk about how much that influences a judge, about how much a father or a mother makes and how, he, how he's able to support. Defense talked about the fact that after the August 31st, 2017 meeting with Hunterton and Nancy, the therapist, when he, he initially got the letter and it didn't include what he wanted, and the fact that well, she agreed to it, but then she was out of town. I thought this was interesting. Uh, this is State's Exhibit 9, and again, you'll have this back there so you can look at it. This is, you'll recall, the login sheet. And you'll see there, on 831.17, uh, individual session is what she said the I stands for. He was there. Then it, he was a no-show. And then a last-minute cancellation. And then there's another four-month break. So he actually doesn't see her again for... Almost seven months. He got what he wanted from the therapist. And then he didn't go back. Month after month after month. Objection. It's not the evidence. I'll close with this, ladies and gentlemen. With instruction five, it explains to you what reasonable doubt is. 
Reasonable doubt is one based on reason. Doubt to be reasonable must be actual, not mere possibility or speculation. Beyond a reasonable doubt is, is a high standard. And it is our burden, Ms. Mishler and I. And we invite that burden and we embrace that burden. The judge talked about, and there's an instruction in there about direct or circumstantial evidence. And defense talked about how there's a lack of, of both. Ladies and gentlemen, in this courthouse, every week, and in courthouses across our country, juries, much like yourselves, sit in chairs just like that and hear cases and find defendants guilty beyond a reasonable doubt every day in this country. And in many, many of those cases, it's purely based on circumstantial evidence. Because men and women like yourselves go in that room, they talk about it, they use their common sense, they put together what they've heard and what they've seen, they connect the dots, and they find what you will find. That the defendant is guilty. And I implore you, ladies and gentlemen, to go back in that room, put your heads together, talk about what you recall, the language that you heard, not that I just said or that defense counsel said, but they, what you recall, the, the people standing on the stand, compare that to the documents, watch the videos, and come back here and tell the defendant what he already knows. He's guilty. Thank you. You do so, Miss Ware, that you will keep the jury together in some private and convenient place, that you will not permit any person to speak to them, nor speak to them yourself, unless it be ordered by the court, except to ask them whether they have agreed upon a verdict, and that you will return them into the court when they have so agreed, so help you God. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in a minute you're going to go back to begin to deliberate. Um, it's, uh, we've, we've already ordered you dinner, so uh, we're going to uh, allow you to go back and uh, deliberate. Um, at this time, uh, although you've all uh, been here for days and certainly done your duty, um, the alternates uh, are going to be allowed to go home. That doesn't mean you're released. Uh, we've had, I've had cases where we've had to call the alternates back uh, because of difficulties. It happens. Um, you have done everything we've asked of you. It doesn't mean just because you're alternates that you uh, didn't, if you will, complete your mission uh, and uh, sometimes it's a letdown that you don't get to deliberate, but I certainly want to thank all of you for being here. Kathy, the alternates. Uh, Jerome Pollock and Tony Ronzik. You are going to go with Sandy, my JEA, Judicial Executive Assistant. People used to say secretary. Um, in any event, she's going to get your phone numbers, your cell phone numbers, uh, to keep uh, you updated as to uh, whether or not we will need you, etc. Um, so that I, I want to thank you again for participating. The rest of you are going to go with Steve. As I said, we've already ordered. Uh, dinner. I want to say one thing which um, is a little bit different. We're going to let you call anybody you'd like to call if you're going to be, uh, because you are going to be uh, after five, but I did tell you that before. Um, but after that, we're going to take your cell phones. They'll be in a box outside the jury deliberation room. And the reason for that is, um, I know that if I don't yet know a question, I Google it. And I can tell you in very recent trials, I had people doing things they weren't supposed to do. So uh, in order to uh, avoid any problems, uh, that's what we're going to do. It's not Steve, it's me. and. Um, It'll just help things go much more smoothly. 
Okay, go ahead. Folks, go ahead, grab all your paperwork, bring your notebooks and pens, grab all your personal paperwork, and you'll follow me. Please rise for the jury. We'll have the evidence back for you in just a couple of minutes.
So I've had my peace judge. I'm making a complete record here. I am appalled by what I've seen in the last 24 hours. In fact, not only appalled, but actually fairly dispirited. I've never seen such an outpouring of, of filth and vile, and I've done murder cases, felony death penalty murder cases, I've never seen anything like this. So I don't know what's happened here. I don't understand the detective's motivations. We're at the end of the trial, and I'm still not quite sure of exactly who did what and why the presiding judge didn't take this matter well in hand and how he had to become a criminal case. But I, I, I believe Mr. McDonald's uh, representation by me has been materially limited. Um, and I have to object and move on this trial. Ms. Mistrial and the jury's gone out? Record requires okay. me to make a judgment. It's on the record. Do you want to stay? And, Your Honor, obviously, obviously the state would oppose the motion. There's been nothing that defense counsel has stated uh, qualifies as a motion for mistrial. I don't want to relitigate all the reasons why a vindictive prosecution is not a valid defense, and Your Honor has denied his motion to dismiss for vindictive prosecution twice now. Um, regarding his claim that there was alleged error regarding the jury instruction, I believe the jury instruction he's referring to is the jury instruction regarding ignorance of the law is no excuse, and defense counsel never objected to that instruction. He just requested that the additional Supreme Court law uh, be added to that instruction, and Your Honor properly ruled that that was not necessary and declined to add that to that instruction. The specific intent instruction that the parties then all agreed to add was then added as a separate instruction. So the states, the state sees no error that was done that was done during rebuttal by publishing a proper standard jury instruction, which correctly stated that ignorance of the law is not a defense to a crime. All right. Thank you. I'm denying the motion for a mistrial. Not sure at this point that's proper, but in any event. Um, you, again, uh, have a good argument regarding your version of the facts, and I understand that, uh, but the facts are what the jury is going to decide, uh, whether they uh, believe the, and, and this is all based on, I believe, your characterization that the uh, detective uh, started this uh, for some vindictive reason based on being, I guess, influenced to do it by this whatever happens or what other, uh, uh, oh, the, the, the posts, the uh, websites uh, that are deal with family court. But that isn't what the testimony is. He testified clearly. I understand you feel he's lying, flat out. Uh, I think that's exactly what you're saying. But that's not what the evidence was, and it's your interpretation of the evidence. Um, the officer said it started as this, but I found out other stuff, and that led to other things. Um, so uh, I understand your theory. Uh, but um, the facts are for the jury to decide. Thank you, Judge. Okay. I appreciate your courtesy. And your uh, you guys, yes, I'll mark this for you as a court's exhibit. That was one that came in about 9 o'clock. Yes, sir. Leave your uh, cell phone numbers. Uh, I am so, oh, those Steve left. Um, we are generally, it's been the four or five. I told you I got them uh, dinner. I probably will let them go till about 8. Um, and so the CEOs need to tell. I was originally, generally, if we're done, I, I thought we'd be done by 3. Uh, you know, I wouldn't keep them past 7. But, uh, of course, it's different. So uh, I don't tell them because I don't want them to, oh, well, OK, we'll get a verdict by then. Uh, at 8 o'clock, that's it. They uh, will the admonishment and uh, uh, they'll come back on Monday morning. Any questions? Generally, you can, if everybody wants to come back for the admonishment, otherwise nobody comes back. You understand that? In other words, it's not one side's here while I admonish them. 
Your Honor, there's also a report I have no uh, objection to not coming back. That's generally the case. But That's why we call it on So if nobody will be here, I'll just monitor them and tell them to be back on Monday. Okay. okay. That's it. That's at 8 p.m. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Or 12. I mean, if something comes up, questions. And by the way, if it's just a simple question, I'll try to get you on a conference call. Um, I've had examples in the past. Um, <coughs> Uh, things like uh, basically we want you to supplement the evidence and the uh, parties all agree you know that the instructions be the court can't supplement the evidence we'll go back and deliberate so anyway I'll try to get you on the a conference call if not we'll call you in all right thank you judge Come order. Department 28 is again in session. Please rise for the jury. Please be seated. 
seated. Parties acknowledge the presence of the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you chosen a four person? And if so, who is the four person? I am, Your Honor. Uh, will you give us your badge number? Your number one, two, um, three, number five. five. Thank you. Will you hand the uh, verdict to the marshal? I have all 12 members of the jury reached a unanimous verdict as to the charges presented to them. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Clerk will now read the, please rise. Clerk will now read the. Uh, District Court, Clark County, Nevada, the state of Nevada versus My Michael McDonald. Case number C, 335-284, Department 28. Verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Michael L. McDonald, as follows. Count one, burglary, <coughs> guilty of burglary. Count two, forgery, guilty of forgery. Count three, offering false instrument for filing a record, not guilty. Count four, burglary, guilty of burglary. Count five, for forgery, guilty of forgery. Count six, perjury, guilty of perjury. Count seven, Offering false instrument for filing or record. <coughs> Guilty of offering false instrument for filing of, or record. Count eight, perjury. Guilty of perjury. Count nine, burglary. Guilty of burglary. Count 10, forgery. Guilty of forgery. Count 11, offering false instrument for filing or record. Guilty of offering false instrument for filing or record. Dated this ninth day of September, jury fourth person. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, are these your verdicts as read? So say you one, so say you all. Yes. Does either party wish to have the jury jury individually polled? The defense would ask that they be individually polled, Your Honor. Poll the jury. <clears throat> juror number one, is this your verdict as read? Yes. Juror number two, is this your verdict as read? Yes. Juror number three, is this your verdict as read? Yes. Juror number four, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number five, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number six, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number seven, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number eight, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number nine, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number ten, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Juror number eleven, is this your verdict is read? Yes. And juror number twelve, is this your verdict is read? Yes. Verdict of the jury shall be recorded in the minutes of the court. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to thank all of you for participating. Uh, you've paid attention. You've spent now a week. Your will be done, God. Here, and uh, we appreciate your efforts and all your work. You are now released. You can now talk to anybody you want about the case. What uh, we're going to do is, Steve is going to take you back to the uh, jury deliberation room. I want to shake everybody's hand and thank you again. If afterwards, a lot of times the uh, attorneys want to uh, ask you questions, it's always a learning experience for everybody. Uh, every trial is different. If you want to answer their questions, feel free to do so. It will be outside. If you don't, Steve will take you, you know, right down the uh, stairs to your cars. Um, again, we appreciate all the hard work, and I want to thank you. Go ahead. Please rise for the jury. Come on down here. Please. Thank you. Matters referred to the Department of Parole and Probation for the sentence report and set up for sentencing.
could not uh, apprehend the unit of view in this case. I'm very disappointed in that very Okay. Um, so you got the, you got the date? Did yes. you say you can't do it that day? I don't have, I was looking more about that because I didn't get my calendar. So I'll leave it on calendar. Okay. We'll have you some All right, trouble. thank you. All right.